So welcome to the Academic Career Series panel, Academia Industry or Both. My name is Dimitar and I'm co-chair of the Academics Research and Careers Committee in the Graduate Student Council. And together with the Careers Office and the Office of the Vice President for Research, we're organizing this panel. So today we have three great speakers. We have Professor Annelies Wigel, who is an assistant professor in MIT Aero Astro Department and MIT's Engineering Systems Division. We have David White, who is Professor of Physics and Applied Physics at Harvard. And we have Lita Nelson, who is Director of MIT's Technology Licensing Office. So the three speakers uh, each have unique perspectives on the, topics, on the topic of academia and industry. And they're going to talk for a little bit, and after that, and after that we'll have a question and answer session. So before I let the speakers uh, talk, I have just one announcement. So there are two more events in the academic career series. One is called Nuts and Bolts of Academic Job Search, and it happens approximately two weeks from now. And the other one is Finding a Good Postdoc, and that happens approximately four weeks from now. So with this, I'm going to hand it over to our panel. Great. Thanks very much, Demeter. Um, I'd like to open our discussions today with a few questions for the audience. I always like to know a little bit more about the group that I'm speaking to. So if you can tell me by a raise of your hands, who are currently pursuing PhDs? Any master's students? How about postdocs? All right, so we've got a lot of PhDs followed by postdocs and master's students, for those of you who might be watching this on video and not able to see the audience. Um, how many of you are in engineering departments? And how many in science departments? And how many in other departments? Wow, so nobody came from Sloan today? Or I guess they all have this figured out already. Um, and my last question for you is, how many of you are thinking about a career in academia? And how many about a career in industry? And how many of you really want to do both? Okay. Ask how many don't know. And how many don't know? <laughs> All right. Well, good. All right. Well, we will hopefully be able to provide you with some of our experiences and insights, and maybe you'll leave today with a little bit more information to think about. So what uh, the panelists will do, I think we'll, we'll introduce ourselves to you, we'll give you a little bit about our backgrounds, and maybe share a piece of advice or two, and then we'd like to quickly get to questions so that we can spend the bulk of our time today addressing things that are important to you. So I'll start. My name is Annalisa Weigel, and I'm, as Demeter said, currently an assistant professor in aeronautics and astronautics in the engineering systems division here at MIT. I actually started my uh, engineering career here at MIT. I was an undergraduate in course 16. Uh, I also did a second degree in science, technology, and society. I think realizing pretty early on that my research interests, my own interests in, in careers and and uh, professional life was, was squarely split between technology and policy kinds of issues. Uh, after I graduated MIT, uh, I, I didn't know that I really wanted to get a PhD. I actually left MIT and went to Washington, D.C. I took a job working at a small uh, systems engineering company supporting the Defense Department. Worked there for a couple of years and started to see a lot of problems it, the problems that we are addressing in our work, that I felt I could just really be better served in addressing these problems if I went back to school. I was pretty sure that back to graduate school I could understand some more tools and methods that I could bring to bear on the problems I was experiencing in industry. So I came back. I got a master's degree initially, and then an opportunity presented itself to stay for a PhD. Um, so I chose to do that as well, and I did my master's degree in aerospace engineering. I did my PhD degree in technology management and policy, which was a new program in the engineering systems division. Um, at that point in time, I had no interest in, in staying in an academic uh, place for the rest of my life, and I left to go take a job on Wall Street where I was doing equity research on aerospace companies and also doing macro equity strategy work. After I spent a couple years doing that and making people lots of money, but working on very short time scale problems, uh, I, I actually got to think about things for a whole week 
whereas colleagues of mine uh, got to think about problems for maybe 10 minutes or an hour before they became old. Um, so I really wanted to do more thinking than just a week, and I came back to take a faculty job here at MIT. And so I've been here for the past eight years in a dual capacity in uh, AeroAstro and the Engineering Systems Division. And the research that I've been doing spans uh, my interest in engineering and policy and in economics, and I've utilized my academic and my industry experiences to, um, to bring those all together, and that really forms the research direction that I have right now. Now, from a career perspective, I'm actually about to embark on a new career change for me. Um, at the end of the summer, I'll actually retire from faculty life here at MIT to do some project-based consulting and spend some time with my two wonderful children, who are two and five, and uh, this will be a new phase for my career. So you can see that I've done a lot of transitions in and out of academia, and who knows how many more times I may yet be in and out of academia. It may go on for a long time, maybe not. Um, but that's my experience in a nutshell. I wanted to also leave you with, with one piece of advice that I've learned along the way. When I first graduated from MIT, left, worked in Washington, DC, I joined my professional society, and all of the, the young graduates in the professional society, we would get together once a month, and we'd bring in a senior leader in our field to come and talk to our group, largely about what they'd done in their career and how they got there, because we all wanted to plan about our careers and, and where they should go and how we should get there. So we brought in retired presidents and CEOs and administrators of agencies and high-level folks, and we asked them, how did you get to where you are today? Tell us the grand secret of your career. And inevitably, each one of them came in and they said, you know, well, I graduated from college and then this interesting opportunity presented itself. And I took that job. And I guess I did a really good job because then they offered me another really interesting opportunity. So I took that because it sounded interesting. And I did a good job on that too. So then someone came around and offered me another interesting opportunity. And this is what all of them said. So it wasn't any grand planning. It was just taking whatever sounded interesting at the time, doing really well at that. And that kind of success begets another interesting opportunity. And then that becomes your career, is a sequence of interesting and successful opportunities that you have along the way between now and retirement. So with that, I'll pass the mic over to David, and he'll tell you a little bit about himself. Thank you, Annalise. Uh, so I'm Dave Waits. Um, gee, I guess I better start with a question, since that's what Annalise said we had to do. Um, who here thinks that uh, finding a job is difficult these days? So you ain't seen nothing. When I graduated as an undergraduate, I read in the newspaper of the town that I was from that PhD physicists were driving taxi cabs because there were no jobs available. And so I thought that was a pretty good deal, so I went off and got a PhD in physics so I could drive a taxi cab. Um, I got my, D, my PhD in physics at Harvard um, a long time ago, and um, I had no idea whether I wanted to go to industry or university um, or when, when I graduated. And uh, one morning I woke up and I knew I wanted to go to industry. And so I always tell my students not to worry if you don't know what to do. One day you'll decide. The person who decided the latest took about three or four years after he graduated with me, but he finally decided. So you do decide eventually. Um, so I uh, wanted to go to industry, but I went to industry in the glory years of corporate research in the United States. This was the late 70s, early 80s. I worked at Exxon before it was ExxonMobil, when it was just becoming a real research organization. Um, everybody modeled their lab after Bell Labs, not realizing that that was an unsustainable model for any private company, because Bell Labs was not a private, or AT&T was not a private company. Uh, but in those days, you could really do uh, research, and I always said my job was more academic than all of my colleagues who went to academia, because I didn't have to write grants, I didn't have to teach uh, classes, I didn't have to deal with students, and I just did research. Um, in fact, that's what I wanted to do, and I spent 18 years doing research. Um, it changed a lot while I was there, uh, so I learned how to uh, learn who my customer was for my research. I learned how to listen what the problem was. I learned how to solve problems. And most importantly for me, I learned how to find good science behind technology and good technology behind science. Um, I moved first to the University of Pennsylvania, which I, where I was a professor of physics for about three years, and then I came to Harvard something like 12 years ago. Um, I now have a fairly large group, um, 
And a lot of our research is supported by working with uh, large corporations um, because I think I know how to talk to them uh, and convince them that we can help them. I know how to listen to them and hear what they want, and I know how to do science that makes a difference. So we still publish good science. And my favorite kind of research with big companies is where I can do something that I can publish in a place like Science or Nature. I can change the way the industry thinks about something, and I can continue doing good research that's funded by other means afterwards. Um, at the same time, uh, when I came to Harvard, um, there's all kinds of opportunities, especially around uh, Boston. And um, I, one of the things I learned while I was at Exxon is what a patent means, when to file a patent and also when not to file a patent. And a patent should only be filed if you can make value from it. Um, and I was very fortunate in the early days that one of the patent people at Harvard told me, well, you should just file a patent on this thing. I talked to her about something. Because you never know, you might want to start a company. And it turned out what we were doing was something that we couldn't do in my lab after a while. And now we've started like four companies, small startup companies from my group, and uh, there are about four more uh, brewing. Um, so a lot of what we do, uh, well, again, we do the science, we do the basic uh, work, but then uh, students and postdocs from my group go off and uh, work for small startup companies both here and um, basically around the world. So our work spans uh, very basic science, uh, science to do with large industry, and uh, science that leads to startup companies. Okay. I'm Lita Nelson, and I guess my career has been divided about in half, the first in industry and the second half at MIT. I'm a course 10 grad, got a bachelor's and master's, uh, got admitted to grad, a PhD program at Harvard and MIT and decided not to do it because I had no patience in laboratories. I was good at exams but not good at labs. Uh, the, uh, I joined my professor's startup company, uh, which was called Amicon, and any of you who have been in biology know what ultrafiltration is, and we kind of invented it. Um, so then I was in a little company, and then I was in a big consulting company in which I found out that a hundred and some odd thousand miles of travel a year plus a three-year-old and a new kid was not a good idea, but I did that for a few years. Uh, then I joined a, a larger company called Millipore that uh, by then, I was actually making product and selling it and making the quarters uh, somewhere, and subsequently a small biotech company. Somewhere in the middle of that, I went back to Sloan as a Sloan Fellow, uh, got my MBA. Uh, they called it Master of Science, which meant I had to do a thesis. Um, and as I said, joined a little biotech company that wasn't working out very well. Somebody told me about this job in the, that the MIT was completely redoing its patent and licensing office and were looking for people with good communication skills who could write and who had technical backgrounds and industrial backgrounds. And I'd always been frustrated, I must say, in engineering because I was more of a communicator. Uh, and that part of me wasn't being used very well. So I said, they don't want me, they want a lawyer. I, I had done some business with the MIT Patent Office, much to my frustration, because it was kind of a black hole. And then it was redone as a technology licensing office, actually modeled on Stanford's. And at the time, I wasn't director at the time, because at the time I said I never wanted to see a budget or a personnel problem again. I was burned out. Uh, but boy, I could be an individual contributor. That didn't last long. Um, and the office has now grown from eight people to 40 people and from three million a year to, well, this year will be about over 100 million, although that won't last because patents expire and then your big winners aren't there anymore. Um, what has changed? is the emphasis nowadays on um, startups, not because necessarily that's the, the, the way we 
want to go all the time, but because industry is thinking, established industry, shorter and shorter time frames, so that academic inventions are not of terrible interest to them. They're too early, too long a time to market it. And most of them would prefer that a startup company took it, took that embryonic technology and brought it to a commercial proof of concept, not just a laboratory proof of concept. Um, and then they either buy the product line or they buy the company. And that has become a very normal way for early stage university-based technology <coughs> to work. Um, along the way, I also, and believe me, MIT undergraduates aren't skilled at it, and I certainly wasn't. You learn people skills, you learn management skills, uh, in addition to the more industrial kinds of skills of listening to the customer and realizing that things have to work uh, and make money. Um, at MIT now, one of the challenges is the volume we, um, we manage. We are now getting 700 invention disclosures a year, which we have to evaluate and figure out whether we're going to file patents on them. About a third of the licensing we're doing now, and I would say significantly more of, than half of the important licensing we're doing now, is to start up companies formed by the faculty and the postdoc and grad students. And the normal process, because this is really a way in which, as David showed you, you really can do both if you're academically inclined and like this other world. Um, they're formed by faculty. Usually the faculty stay um, in the university because they're smart enough to know they don't want to run a company and probably aren't good at it. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the postdocs or the grad students then go off. We license them the intellectual property, the patents, but they go off with the know-how. And as Bob Brown, who you guys probably know as president of BU, but he used to be provost here, said about it that technology transfers best in objects that wear shoes. So uh, that's my story. Great. All right, thanks, Lita. Thanks, David. Uh, so we'd really like to open up to questions from the group. Give us some topics that you'd like to hear about, and we will do our best to share our experiences. And I understand that Demeter has questions for us also. Is that? So, so when we asked you to register, uh, we included a question on the form if you, if you have uh, suggested questions for the panel, and I have a list of those, but if you have questions on the spot, please go ahead. And if not, I can fill in from the list. Please don't be bashful. Volunteer questions today. So we hear the questions coming from a real person. You can give us some more perspective on them. Go ahead. Very well, so tell us what's your background and why are you thinking about this question? So uh, my advice to you is uh, to be strategic. Postdoc is uh, stopping a stepping stone. It should be something that's a lot of fun. It be something you learn something new, but it should also get you a job. It should be the, the stepping stone to a job. And I'd go to the best place you can go, the best person you could go, the most fun work. Uh, 
It doesn't matter where it is. You just want to go somewhere where you can do really good, cool work, and that'll get you known. So then you have a choice wherever you want to go. I don't think it's a matter of whether it's uh, industry or uh, academia. I think you can find a job in, in industry after working in academia, and you can find a job in academia after working in industry. So it doesn't really matter. I think I'd add one caution, though. There are two kinds of industrial postdoc. One in which you're doing the kind of fundamental research that will give you the publications and the reputation, believe me, the letter of recommendation from somebody who is recognized in the field. The other kind is more industrial engineering, and although you learn a lot about how industry works, whether that's a good stepping stone to academia, I'd be very careful. You mentioned that you, you're not interested in academia at no, this point. No, he said he was. I, I, I was. I'm not anymore. Oh, you're not anymore. <laughs> then, <laughs> then as an engineer, my phrase would be, why do a postdoc? Go get a job. Because they don't, re <laughs> unlike academia, industry doesn't require postdocs. Yeah. So if you, if you still feel like you're exploring, as David said, a postdoc is a great opportunity. It's just essentially a longer internship for those who have already finished their PhD, right? Because you have no more summers between your semesters to go and take jobs to try to get some exposure and help you figure out where you want to go. So you can use it as a way to gain some neat new experience or fill in some experience that you're missing or use it, as, as David was saying, as a strategic jumping off point. So if you know you get that kind of experience that will lead you into the next job that you want. I have to say that um, I didn't do a postdoc. I wish I did. Um, I always ask my postdocs, would they trade places with me? But they're all too damn smart. They know that they're having much more fun than I am. Yeah. And that's a time to have really a lot of fun. So yeah, and I, I think it, it doesn't hurt to learn to broaden your experience no matter where you go. You're going to be a better scientist after two years of a postdoc. Yeah, I, I agree with those comments. I did not do a postdoc either. but. You know, you don't have to take classes, you don't, you don't have to raise money, you don't have a lot of the responsibilities, and you just get to do cool work. I imagine it's got to be one of the greatest positions ever. Hi, my name is Lori. I'm a biology PhD student, and I think after four years here going to different these panels, I, I want to get your perspective, but I've noticed there is a, there's a fundamental difference between PhDs from the engineering side versus biological sciences. First of all, you mentioned the summers off that engineering students get. Well, no. we don't really get that. And also, um, someone else mentioned that you could um, just do a two-year postdoc, which seems very, well, at least in my experience of people I see in my lab, that's very, very not normal for a biological science PhD. So for me, you know, this whether I should do a postdoc or not in industry, is a much more time commitment sink that I have difficulty figuring out. So if you have interacted with biology PhD students in your lab, what would you advise? Yeah, you know, I, I, I did want to make that comment in addressing the previous question too, is that, you know, whether or not you take a postdoc, how long it is, whether it's strategic, is a function of the field that you're in. And whether you take it in academia or industry, in biology can also be very important. I'm not a biologist, but I have biologist friends who remarked that, that that's important as well. So it's really, it's really key to know what's, what the norms are in your field and what the expectations are. You know, I, I have heard from other people in biology-related fields that if you go out into industry, you know, your academic colleagues will perceive you as somehow different now in, an, in a non-favorable way. That's a traditional perception, right? Now, that, that may or may not be the case in different departments that you want to go into, but it's important to understand what the cultural expectations are. Yeah. I mean, that's just the difference between essentially NSF-like funding and NIH-like funding. There's so much funding for biology that there's so many people doing biology that there's just not enough jobs. In engineering, there's not as much funding, and there's so many jobs. People in my lab, you know, two, three years, that's it. They all get jobs. Nobody leaves my lab without getting a job. Um, and that's just because engineering or the kind of science that we do is just much more, less well represented and, and much higher demand. And engineering students don't, don't typically get the summer off. 
but uh, you know, it's all individual with your advisor whether or not you can work out to take a summer to do some other experience. So, some students can, some students can't. Well, I think department. there's more acceptance of it in the engineering professions than it is in the pure science professions. Yeah, agreed. Because they, many of the, uh, many engineers are not going to spend their whole lives doing science. They're going to go into management, marketing, other things, uh, so that the skills that they learn on these summer jobs are as valuable as the extra two months of pipetting. So uh, for us, um, we most of the startups, especially in this part of the country, most of the startups are biotech. I mean, this is the sort of a center for biotech, although we have one materials-based startup, um, which is actually uh, in Marseille, France, not in, in the U.S. even. Um, and. Um, for me, I do things, my goal in my career and in, in my science is I want to have impact. I want to do things that make a difference. And there are things that come, that, that we get to a stage where I see there's a huge impact that we can have, but it's not right to do in an academic lab. You need a team of engineers to put something together, to do something, uh, to make something happen. And then that's when we um, either will license it to a large company, but they tend not to be able to, as uh, Leo said, they, they just can't really develop things anymore. Um, so we do a startup. And um, since there have been quite a few startup companies come from my group, people all know what, what that entails because there have been so many people who've worked in the, these companies. And so it's an accepted route for employment. And people who are interested in that go and do that. People who aren't, you know, they, they self-select. Um, I can more or less tell who would be good for a startup company. The people who are going to be really great in a startup company also are going to be really great in industry, in the university. It's the same skill set. Um, and, um, but, but people decide for themselves. What field are you in? Sorry? What field are you in? Uh, I'm in course 16. Oh, course 16. Very good. And also, I'm not a U.S. citizen, so it oh. makes things a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll start with that one. Um, um, in, in terms of experience and coming back to engineering, so first, you know, it's, it's much more acceptable to go out into industry in an engineering field than in a science field because uh, engineering is all about how to use essentially the scientific knowledge we have for the betterment of humanity. And folks out in industry are the ones who are really doing that on a practical basis, right? They're making our products and systems. So it's good to get that kind of experience that provides you insights that you're not going to get in your academic courses, right? Um, in terms of publishing, as David said, the, the true industrial lab environments of the 70s are unfortunately gone today. So the publishing opportunities are smaller. But that said, there's ways you can work that into a, a career in industry. The first thing you want to do is make sure that your, your paying job does not take, say, 80 hours a week. So if you go into investment banking or consulting where you have literally zero free time, uh, you're not going to have any time to write. You're not going to have any time to think about something that is publication worthy. On the other hand, if you're doing a job that, that allows you to have the time to do that, then you'll be able to continue with that. 
Um, there's also some great things you can do for a couple years of getting papers from your PhD out the door. And from a sort of a rival publication standpoint on your resume, they sort of keep arriving after you finish your PhD for a couple years, depending on, again, how many papers you have and the journals and the timelines and so on. So if you're looking at the publication gap, just a couple years doesn't tend to make a lot of difference. But then after you get beyond a couple years, that's when it really can start to show up if you're not arranging a circumstance to allow you to continue to do the kind of activities that result in papers. And do remember that many companies won't let you publish in the engineering space. So if you're planning on an academic career, you have to be very strategic if you take time off. So um, I, of course, don't always do things the way you're supposed to do things. And so I know what everybody says, that you can't go from industry to academia but I did, and you can't go from academia to industry, but I know lots of people who do, and that you can't get a job in academia if you haven't published. I know somebody who works for Exxon now who hasn't published for 15 years and could get a job tomorrow at almost any university that he wants. Um, I've watched postdocs of mine work in startup companies for five or seven years and easily get tenured offers from universities like this one because they do things. So there are rules and regulations and there's, as with all rules and regulations, there's lots of exceptions. So, and um, also, fortunately, so far, this country, even now, is pretty good about admitting the fact that many, many of the contributors to science and engineering are not born in this country. That's what makes this place really exciting. So I wasn't born here either. I'm also an immigrant. And I'm constantly signing forms to get people green cards because you know, we need people here. So I don't think I'd worry about that either. I mean, you, you do have to think about it a bit strategically in Aero Astro because if you're thinking about a startup company, or an industry that is tied to the defense industry as much of Aero Astro is, it's hard to get employment at those companies because they require you to be a U.S. citizen. I was just down on Capitol Hill a couple weeks ago running a, a seminar about some new legislation to change visa issues and, and help with that. But uh, it is still a consideration. So if you're thinking about going into industry and staying here in the U.S. as a foreign national, you might not actually be in Aero Astro. You might be in a sort of related industry that doesn't have ties to uh, the defense community. More questions and curiosities. Speak up. Lita, you probably also have some comments. Uh, you want to start? Yeah, having done it bef in, or started doing it in the days before they invented daycare centers. Yeah. And where most women, professional women, did not work when they had families. Uh, start with the right partner. <laughs> Start with somebody who considers your career is as important as theirs. Otherwise, it's virtual. It's not impossible because many single mothers do it, but sure makes it easier. Um, a difficulty in academia, again, not impossible, is that nowadays with people having their children later, the crunch before uh, tenure, the tenure pull, the push, usually is happening about for women when the biological clock is going tick, tick. Uh, so some schools are much better than others. Some very fine universities offer a way of resetting the tenure clock. Uh, probably once you get past that, it may be easier in academia. Um, in industry, I would say, don't take time off. I'm not talking about months, I'm talking about years, because it's very hard to get back on the ladder. Not impossible, but very hard to get back on the ladder at the point you left it, as opposed to much lower. But you do it. You just do it. I mean, I had two kids. My daughter's a pediatrician and raising two kids. You can do it, but you 
got to think about it and you have to, now I'm going to get really cynical, you have to be one of these people that realizes that your children don't need you 24 hours a day. They will still bond to you and love you and grow up and be intelligent and get good educations, even if you let someone else do a good job minding them. All right, well, I'll offer a different perspective than Lita. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, starting a family, you have to decide how, how, how important that is to you, like everything else in life. You know, you, have a, a, you want a family or a career or, or certain things you want to do in life, and you just put that in perspective. Um, starting a family can be challenging, whether you're in industry or academia. And uh, in academia, say, we say you can put in your 60 hours a week anytime you want. But when you calculate out what's left after 60 hours, there's not a lot of time left. So while you have some flexibility of when you put in those hours, you still got to put in a lot of your hours. Um, so I don't think that for some reason academia might be an easier place yeah. to have children. Um, it has a little less structure, but it still has a total time commitment that's equivalent to a, you know, a high-powered industry job. So both of those take some time. Um, I, I would actually... Uh, not agree with Lita's comment about uh, being careful of stepping off a ladder. I think the career ladders these days are not as structured and regimented as they were decades ago. Um, there's much discussion, much discussion among uh, the women my age who are just starting families about the, the new way forward of families and careers and how it's not going to look like our predecessors. So, you know, what I would tell anybody, male or female, contemplating starting a family is that. Um, the new rules are going to be different than the old rules. You know, decide what's important to you, put your energies there, and at the end of the day, just make sure all the choices you're making really agree with how you feel inside. And at the end of the day, you're going to feel great with those choices. I hope you're right. <laughs> I'm going to say I know I'm right. There's, there's nothing I say that I about, but I, I, know that, I know that I'm right about it's that It's going one. to be different. Whether it will be different in the right direction, yeah. we will see. <laughs> Vote for the right people. Yeah. Go ahead, up in the back. So, uh, my question for Professor uh, Wade. So, I want to know, uh, after that many years experience in the industry, why, why, why did you uh, eventually decide to go back to the uh, media and uh, why didn't you uh, I think he doesn't know they don't exist. So, um, first of all, AT and T, Bell Labs uh, don't really exist anymore. They, the the death knell was sounded when they became a private company, and when, whenever uh, AT and T was broken up into the mini Bells. That was the end of Bell Labs. It took maybe 10 years, but they decayed away. Because there's no sustainable model of spending that much money on research without having some ultimate goal, which, you know, if, if you're, uh, in those days, AT&T was a monopoly. So you were taxed every telephone call you made. Some fraction of the, the cost of that telephone call went to support research. So it was, it was the best run national lab. It was the only really, really, really outstanding national lab because it was run like an industry. Um, so it was, a, it was a real national resource. And many companies tried to mimic that, not completely recognizing that it was completely unsustainable for a private company. Um, so that doesn't exist anymore. It does exist in name, except it doesn't do fundamental research anymore. So there's still an organization called Bell Labs, but it's, it's as different as a giraffe and a hippopotamus. I think it's more different. I think it's more different. <laughs> now, why I uh, decided to uh, leave is um, when you work in, in when you, well, there are two things. First of all, when I started in industry, it was really, I could do really anything I wanted. You have no idea how flexible things were in those days. It was a day, it was just after the oil crises, people thought they were going to run out of oil. They were buying companies. Exxon was buying companies. They had a company in every business, and they said, oh, we'll come to the research lab and just do research on anything that impacts the company. So it was fantastic. We defined a whole new field of science while I was there, which is the, still the field that I work in. Um, but after you've been there a while, first of all, it 
became more and more that in order to do research, the way it was funded changed. It was no change. It was no longer funded by the corporation. It was funded more and more by the line management, the business management. So I had to spend a huge amount of my time uh, getting a consensus among business people that what I was doing was better than you know advertising or drilling another oil well or something really practical. Uh, and I didn't enjoy that. Um, I worked really hard when I was there to avoid being a manager. And if you're successful in a company, the first thing they want you to do is become a manager. So I had to always say no so I could stay in the lab and do research. Um, and that became more and more impossible. I realized that if I wanted to keep my career there, I'd have to go and travel and uh, go and work in different places. I didn't want to do that. And also, when I was there, uh, it's changed, but when I was there, I, I noticed something, it was never formalized, but I noticed something that when people turned 50, they started to get unhappy. And when they turned 55, they were annuitants, so they could leave with some fraction of their salary, some significant fraction of, sal of their salary, and most of them did. Most people left when they turned roughly 55. And as I got older, I said, I didn't want to retire when I was 55. I was having too much fun. So I thought it was time to move and go to university. Um, yeah, well, in the field that I am, um, you know, you don't apply for a job at Harvard unless you're a junior faculty. And so sometimes they ask you, would you like to go? And you have one chance if they ask you if you want to go. And so it took me about a year and a half to decide. I finally decided, okay, I do it. And I did it because um, the area I do research in was not at the time at all represented at Harvard. Nobody was doing that. What's uh, it's soft condensed matter physics. Um, and now there's a big representation. Um, it's also not a big area of, uh, certainly in physics departments. Uh, there are very few people in MIT, for example, who do that. Um, and I felt that to really have a impact in the scientific community, being at a place like Harvard with the quality of students and the number of students that I would have was the best way to have an impact. That's always what I want to do. And so I felt that was the best chance to have an impact for, for the field. And I think that's true. I'll start by commenting, um, I have a number of research projects that are sponsored by industry, and what you're doing as a faculty member is, is looking for intersection of your interests and the company's interests. Um, in engineering, I find that that's always very easy because my ultimate end goal is to help society do something better. Right? So you just have to find in a project that you craft something that's going to be publishable and more basic for you and something that's also going to be more applied in near-term interest to the company. To do that just takes a little bit of practice and creativity, but you develop a skill for it after a while. And it's similar to what David was mentioning about learning to see from your customer's perspective and try to meld your interests together. So, so I've uh, worked long enough in an organization where people tried to do basic research um, in a place where you had to do research that made a difference to realize that 99% of the time when people say it's long-term research, it's boring, unimportant research that they're talking about. If you want to do something that really makes a difference, I don't know about you, but I'd write much rather have a difference tomorrow than a year from now and then 10 years from now. It's just, where is there good research? And the places that do the longest range research that's really good research are big companies because they can afford to do that and they see what the problem is and they do really, really good development projects, really good science that they'll spend 10 or 12 years to, to develop. Uh, you look at Exxon, uh, ExxonMobil now, you look at some of the, the big biology companies, 
they'll take 10 years to get something to market. So that's where you do really good long-range research. If you want to do really, really good high-impact research, it's not stuff that's going to lead to something 20 years from now. It's because you don't know what's going to lead in 20 years from now. It's boring. Do something that makes a difference. start for me? <laughs> well, so I, uh, I spent most of my career in academia at MIT, but I have colleagues who come from other places, and uh, yeah, every culture is, is different. Right? Every academic institution is different. Um, it's a good idea to, to find some of your colleagues at other schools and start talking about what the cultural differences are, and you can eventually find a place that you feel is a good fit for you if you're interested in an academic career. What, what's kind of the root of your question? Why do you want to know? Um, I'm just wondering if Ah, I see. The, the inevitable sort of, do I have to look like my advisor question. <laughs> um, the, the answer is, is no, right? So every institution is different. If you're going to go to another high-powered research institution like Harvard, like MIT, you're probably going to end up looking like your advisor if you're going to be really successful. You know, it just takes, a, it does take a reasonable amount of time and it's a commitment. It's a really passionate, high-powered job. Um, that said, there are a number of other academic institutions that might say they have much more of a work-life balance, you know, and that you're not in the lab 24-7. Um, these are not your top-tier research institutions, but they're still very respectable academic places. And it's all just thinking about yourself and what you feel is important to you in your job and finding an academic institution that has that balance for you of, of what's important. Let me... I'll uh, talk about differences along a different parameter, although I totally agree with what Annalise had said. Uh, the uh, other parameter is that at MIT you're getting a somewhat unique experience in terms of two things. One is the interactions with industry, just statistically, and the other is entrepreneurship. MIT now has about 18% of its funding, and that's only on campus, not counting Lincoln Lab, of course, which is different. About 18% of its uh, funding from industry now. In other places, it's the national average is under six or seven, so there's a much more of a partnership with industry focus in terms of large companies. We also do Oh, maybe on the maybe f more than five times the national average of number of startups a year, and the that doesn't mean that Stanford's not pretty close to us, but not many others are, uh, and we have that whole entrepreneurial ecosystem of everything from the entrepreneurship center to the Dishpandi center to the venture mentoring service and the all the student entrepreneurship clubs. Now, in terms of lifestyle of an academic, that means there's probably some peer pressure to do both at once rather than, uh, than stay sanely in your lab for only a ridiculous amount of time instead of an absurd, try to do an absurd amount of time by doing both. But the culture here is not typical. So, but for different reasons, not, I agree completely that if you want to be a top-notch academic in a top-notch school, it's, it's very demanding. But then they do other things here at the same time. I actually maybe have a slightly different perspective. You don't have to be like your advisor. I never want people to be like me. Um, I want them to be like whatever they want. And I never tell people, I don't tell people in my group, you got to work, you know, 18 hours a day and seven days a week. I say, you gotta work the amount of time you, you wanna balance with your life. If you wanna have a career, you gotta balance it with your life. The, the reason you see, the reason I work hard is I've never worked a day in my life. I've only had fun. I'm always having fun. 
That's what I like. That's, it's, I'm just passionate about what I do. And so there's just so many things I want to do. That's why I spend the time doing it. But I, I enjoy all the things I do. And so your problem is not, do you have to work that hard? But if you're having so much fun, how do you keep yourself from working that hard? Um, I'll just add that there was a, one of the recent faculty surveys surveyed uh, us and asked how many hours a week we all spend in our jobs. And the non-tenured faculty, it was an average of 65 hours a week, and the tenured faculty was 64 hours a week. So, I mean, it's, it's very high here, but as Lita said, I, I think we are a little bit of an anomaly. You know, but that said, it's demanding anywhere you go. And like David said, if it's, if it's really your passion, then you don't, it doesn't feel like work. But if you've got competing interests like family and, and, and religious activities and other extracurriculars, and like you go on and, and name what interests could be, then you may feel some, some conflicting pressure there. And you want to find a situation that allows you to be yourself and do what, what matters to you. And you can do that at MIT, too. You can certainly do it in other places. If you want to, you don't have to work all your hours at your job. You still can get tenure. You still can be successful, especially if you're really focused. Um, and you can do other things. It's just a balance in life. Sure, well, there's certainly not many positions in industry that are built around teaching. So if you really like teaching, you're probably thinking of yourself as an academic, and there are plenty of academic institutions that focus on, if not solely, are looking for people to teach. They are not the MITs of the world, but there's, there's lots of other institutions like that. You'll find it in the job descriptions, you know, whether the focus is really on research or teaching or some expectation of both. And you just want to look for those kinds of positions that are going to be more focused on teaching than on research. The background. I'd like David's comments as well, but you know, here at MIT, we are equally doing teaching and research. Right? Your expectation as a faculty member here is to do both. If you really love research, there is a research track side of MIT careers and other research institutions where you are on the research staff, and that's all you do all day long. And, and you can rise pretty high in those ranks and have your own PI status and, and almost run labs. So if, if teaching is something you really don't like, you know, maybe you want to look into uh, a part of academia that's, that's solely about research. And industry, of course, you can do a lot more research, but there's always, you always have to communicate what you've done. In industry, you have to do it not necessarily through papers, but through a lot of time spent communicating to your peers or your bosses. In um, academia, you do it by communicating to your students. Are you looking for advice on graduate school? I'm like, why would that, like, what, what should I do, like, if I don't know if I'm in industry or graduate school or Don't worry, then. Uh, yeah, well, that, like Leah said, I think you're a sophomore. Don't worry about it yet. You've got a lot of time to figure it out. Um, but you have got summer opportunities, so use your summers to explore what industry is. Um, you've been, in nine months, you're in your academic environment, so you're getting lots of experience there. Go out and work and check out environments. And sometimes the jobs you have during the summer that you hate are the most valuable ones because it tells you, okay, I don't like that, and I don't want to go into that. And you can string a couple of those experiences together to help you narrow the field of what might be interesting to you. Um, when I showed up at MIT as a freshman, during our freshman orientation period, I was meeting all my classmates, and we were, were so excited and driven, and we were already asking ourselves, before we even started classes, what are you going to do when you graduate? And all of my peers said, oh, I'm going to go to graduate school. And I said, graduate school? What, what's graduate school? No one in my family had ever gone to graduate school. 
Um, and they said, oh, well, it's, it's more school after you graduate. <laughs> and I looked at them, I said, really? Well, I'm, I'm gonna get a job, I'm gonna go out and work. Of course, that's what you do when you, you graduate. Um, so, you know, just to say that the perceptions and what you think you might do now is not necessarily what you might want to do later. And just think about all these opportunities you have during your undergraduate time to explore different options and, and get your feet wet in them and see how you really feel about them. Yeah, that's an excellent suggestion. Thank you so much. Your ops are really great to do if you're thinking about going to graduate school, because it does tell you whether or not you might be interested in that or whether it's really not your thing. Because you know, in your master's degree, you're doing your research, you're taking classes, and well, if you don't like your research too much, that's okay, you can finish that. But you really want to know if you like research before you get into a PhD and make that commitment. Or you'd hate to get into that and then figure out, I really don't like this too much, but you can always, of course, leave. Sure. Um, so all, all the research that I do, I, I don't get any money from NSF. I don't apply to big grants where the win ratio is like two to five percent. All of the things that I do are working with you know, mission agency customers and the government or with industry. Because I was there, I know what their problems are. I know what they're experiencing. I know how to go and tell them how I can help them. Um, so that relationship, having the experience and the knowledge, as much as David was relating, that lets you go and do, in my mind, better research because I know my customers and I've been in their shoes, so I can help them out. So I, uh, um, I get money from little grants where the success ratio was one in two in two in a hundred, whatever it was. Yeah, they're horribly low. Yeah, I get money from them. Uh, I get money from uh, big grants where. Success ratio is very low. I get money from industry. I get money wherever I can. If it's money, I'll use it. Turns out it's all green and all works. Um, <laughs> it pays the salaries. Um, my my relationship with industry is is I don't know what they want, but I'm willing to listen and figure out what it is they want. And I'm I find myself just generally curious. And I think that anybody any good industry can tell me what their problem is, and I can find something that I think is really super interesting to do. Um, and that's what I want to do. I want to do something that's really interesting uh, that still solves their problem. So uh, I don't know what, they, what their problem was, because I work now with industries I never knew anything about. But I, I know how to listen and ask what their problem is and sort it out. And that's the, the most important thing, uh, that's the hardest thing to learn, is how to listen. Yeah, I completely agree. I don't think David's giving his skill nearly enough credit about being able to listen. Lots of people can sit there and take in information, but to process it and figure out how you can help somebody with that, that's really a tremendous skill. Um, when I started out my first professional job, I worked for a small business, and we learned, you know, one of the first rules is we're not gonna bid on something unless we have a reasonable chance of winning because you have to expend resources in bidding proposals. And so I kind of brought those philosophies back into my research program. So I tend not to apply for the very small chance but lots of work involved in proposals. I go and I find my research customers, we have some conversations and I try to invest my time really wisely, and that's kind of where I'm coming from, but it was all shaped by my own experiences and things that I've learned along the way. I think it's the same way you're gonna do it regardless of where you are in your timeline, right? Um, you have your set of research interests. You need to make sure that you're keeping up your, your references because you're gonna be asked for a certain number of letters of recommendations. So if you're going out into industry, you, know, you don't wanna let your relationships with your, your key faculty mentors lapse because those are the people you really wanna have writing strong letters of recommendation for you when you apply. Um, I mean, you have to know what you're interested in research-wise. You have to be able to convey that and convince people that it's worthy and important and that you know what you're doing. So how much did you start planning based on your interest in research? Was it your industry? I, 
it, it's, it's really individual. I was not doing a whole lot of research in my industry position. Um, so I was really drawing on my PhD experience for creating my research plan, um, as was one of my colleagues came back to join my department after spending five years at McKinsey. So, and, and he's doing research in structures. Nothing he did at McKinsey related to structures at all. Right? So we, we formulate our research plans based on staying engaged with the areas and knowing what's really important and trying to address some of those needs. Well, that's an interesting question. You want to? If yeah. you're almost done, the PhD is becoming a credential in so many places. It's almost like a college degree used to be. Uh, whether it's worth starting when you know you're not going to do it and are you going to spend seven years in PhD? Maybe not. But if you're halfway there, finish. I, I agree with that. So I'll give you an example. A student came to me. Um, she was Chinese. Um, she'd worked for four years in a different research lab, and she was just fed up with research. She said she really wanted to do entrepreneurship, tax transfer. What could I tell her? I said, well, you ought to get, a, uh, get your degree, because it's going to do you good if you get a degree. And so I helped her get a degree doing some studies of uh, you know, tech transfer that we were doing with the big company, with the little company, just something that would give her a little bit of preparation, not real business preparation, because I'm not a business person, but something like that, just so she could get her degree. Yeah. And she went back, and she's a consultant in China now, and she really benefits from the fact that she's a PhD from Harvard, because she has all the connections that she can make. It's just this enormous Plus the network. the credential. Exactly. So it's, let, you know, it's it ought to be artificial, it. but it's not. Um, I, I agree with, with most of that. I, I would just encourage you to think about what the worth of that credential is in your area. So a, a lot of folks in, in Aero Astro, you know, if you want to go into industry, a PhD is honestly not a valued credential. You know, a company is not going to say, ooh, I'm going to hire you because you got the PhD over the person who got the master's over the bachelor's. They unfortunately think PhDs are way too qualified for anything that they do which is a perception we're slowly starting to change in industry. It's a bad perception. Um, but, but you have to ask about the value of the degree and what you specifically want to do. Um, and it may offer connections. You know, here in this country, if you want to aspire to government-appointed service in technical area, a PhD is sort of a necessary prerequisite. You can't really get it unless you have one. So think about that. Um, and, and then on the flip side, if you're utterly miserable and you hate what you're doing, why would you stay here one more day? Yeah, and if you notice a theme in all of my comments, it's about personal happiness, figuring out what's really important and meaningful to you. Um, so you, you got to figure that out. So if you have such students in your lab, what's your minimum requirement for them to graduate? <laughs> <laughs> you might ask me if I'm taking more students. I'm not taking any more students now. But I'm, I'm kind of curious, what department are you in? Computer science. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure what the standards for graduation are in your group. But you know, have this discussion with, with people that, whose opinion you value in your field. It may be your advisor, it may not be. That could be a dangerous conversation. But seek out other mentors who can help you work through yeah, the situation. In my group, once somebody stops gaining value from being there, I don't want them there. So if they've lost, you know, if, they, if they're not gaining anything, if they're not learning anything, not taking advantage of the group, there's no point in being there. Uh, you know, if they can get their degree, they don't need to have that many papers. And I don't care because they're not, it's not helping them, it's not helping me.
Recycling your posts on, you know, there's lengthy in the tunnel and in the end they felt like they wasted a lot of time doing that. I wonder if, the, if there's a, a similar thing to expect from it from, say, going into industry as opposed to, to starting a, out a postdoc with one engineering and what you have to say on that. Um, you know, every, every organization has, you know, certain promotion ladders that you go through. <laughs> Whether you see them as pyramidal or more ladder-like often depends on the culture of the company. Um, there, are, there are certain industries that are known for that, like law it tends to be an up or out kind of industry. Academia tends to be an up or out kind of industry. Um, management consulting tends to be an up or out kind of industry where you feel that intense pressure and there's this, this very rigid progression of how, how you work through things. Um, but there's lots of industry where that's not the case. Um, but the pressures are all different. You could go to a small startup where you don't feel like this gigantic pyramidal organization, but you've got all kinds of other intense pressures on you to succeed. Um, or for the company to succeed. Yeah. Well, and, and you are the yeah. company. You know, you five, ten, you know, twelve people, you're broke, the company. Right. Yeah. There's risk to be taken in, in all different places. So, so my experience is um, both in large companies and startup companies, um, having a breadth of experience is far more important than having specific experience mm -hmm. because almost any company you go to, maybe it's different in aerospace, but in anything that I do, almost any company you go to, what you do two years later will be totally different than what you're doing when you start. Um, in a startup, it's completely different. Um, in a good university position, it's also really different. So having the ability to uh, learn, I mean, my, my view is always, you're a graduate student, you learn how to learn. When you're a postdoc, you learn how to choose problems and how to solve different problems and how to go from one field to another field. And that's a, a, a kind of experience that will serve you well no matter what job you have. So rather than thinking that you're doing penance for, uh, for three years, think that you're, getting, you're having a lot of fun. If you go to a good place, you're doing some really cool stuff and you're learning uh, expertise that will serve you well no matter where you go. Could I add one more thing in that general learning how to learn? Particularly in industry, learn how to write. Learn how to write well, learn how to write, but also in academia, in proposals. Learn how to describe a problem and its solution in a clear, short, convincing way. It's an extraordinary skill and will probably differentiate you from your peers in a significant way. I spent most of my time teaching people how to write, so much so that there's a document on my website telling you how to write a paper in my book, because it's and, so important. And I don't tend to take on students who don't know how to write. She's but lucky. It's, it, <laughs> it's not just write papers, it's just truly communicating. Exactly. Exactly. And putting the problem in a way that the audience knows where you're going before you get there, rather than shaggy dog stories or long lists of things. Or, it's a very important skill. So uh, the skills you need are how to identify a new problem, how to be absolutely, utterly, and totally fearless about going into a new problem, how to let the problem guide what you do, not what you think should guide the problem, um, how to solve the problem in as creative way as you can, and how to communicate it, both orally and in a written way, that you can convince people that what you've done is really something new and exciting. Um, and for me, postdocs are ready to go when they have a sense that they know 
roughly how to choose a problem. I don't care if they just choose the problem they're working on. As long as they see where it's going, they have a, has, have a vision of what they want to do. Um, and where they can communicate in a way that they can convince people that they have a vision. You know, I'd be as interested listening to this whole thing to ask a different question. Annalisa started, how many of you want to go into academia? And how many of you wanted to go into industry? Now I'm going to ask, how many of you want to go into something other than research? It's nobody. Interesting. Well, I got one to admit it, that other than scientific research, yeah. Okay, everybody wants to stay in it. So maybe this conversation was more relevant to the whole audience than I thought it was because some people want to do other things. But this is a fairly homogeneous audience because people do do other things in industry. <laughs> <laughs> but but Leo, I think you're absolutely right. But what the, the, the nice thing, in both in academia and in, in industry, is that the nice thing, at least for me, about doing research is that you can do anything after that. You can go to management, you can go into policy, you can do really whatever you want. It's, you should let your, your nose guide you. Where, where, as Annalise said, where is that next really cool, exciting prod, problem that you like to do? Yeah, because I get quite a number of people who come to my office with PhDs who are looking to transition away from the laboratory, which I think we didn't discuss at all. But maybe we didn't need to. Yeah. What we didn't tell them is that when you go to university, you transition away from the laboratory because your students and your postdocs have all the fun. But I mean, many, yeah, many, many start in the engineering field, nope. start in R&D maybe for a couple of years, but start to transition into product management, manufacturing, management of people, marketing. Many of them come up from sci scientific backgrounds. They do patent law. They do law. They do medicine, some of them although that would not be industry. They do technology transfer. They do many things other than simply solving, uh, not simply, but then purely solving scientific problems. They may be solving social problems. They may be solving market problems. Uh, and once they get into management, which David has carefully avoided, they learn to solve people problems. But I'm sure you do that in your lab, too. Uh, the day I yeah. went to university is the day I became a manager. So yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I studiously avoided yeah, it until so, I went to university. And uh, I know for a fact that they drive taxi cabs, and they take out garbage. If you go to a startup company, you're going to take out the garbage as well. So there's a lot of things you can and, do. What and, can't you do? And too few of them, maybe for all sorts of interesting reasons, too few of them go into politics. We have a relatively scientifically ignorant Congress. No, I'm, I'm just saying they have no background in it. I think there is one scientist in the house or something. You know, I mean, it's just uh, more of that's needed. I think Annalisa can. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, can you give me more context on your question? What do you want to know about and why? I'm going to have to leave. I have another. Um, I mean, I'm very sorry. Thanks, Lita. It's just some, something else that I'm interested in. I guess one thing I don't particularly like about working for the industry is how it seems to me like a lot of companies are driven by profit and not so much by making you know, the world a better place. Yeah, so you, you might want to look into, you could work for governments, you can work for nonprofit organizations, um, non-governmental organizations. A lot of those organizations have the same kind of alignment that you're discussing. Um, they're all out there and they do really, really interesting work. When you're not, when you don't have a profit motivation, you actually get involved in some, some fantastic problems uh, that you get to solve. A lot of those kinds of organizations have um, trusted relationships in problem solving in the government. 
um, they get to work on so these, these big problems of our times because they don't have a profit invested in the answer. So they get to actually do very interesting analyses that contribute to it. Um, it's, it's absolutely an option. And one of the great things about working for the government or with the government is that you tend to get to work on big projects with big budgets that have big implications. If you actually are a government civil servant here in the US, you can be responsible for millions to billions of dollars projects a couple years out into your career. Whereas you don't tend to get that in industry at the same point in your career. You tend to have smaller responsibilities. But along with the larger responsibilities and working for government tends to come with smaller paychecks. Usually paychecks are bigger in industry. Uh, so it's a trade-off. And it's, again, figuring out what's really you know, where your interests are and where you want to contribute. That is a hard question to ask the parent of a two and five year old. <laughs> um, you know, I could go on for hours on that topic, but uh, let's suffice it to say that, you know, if you have your priorities in line, you will make everything work to your satisfaction. You know, don't, don't let somebody else try to set your priorities. You know, figure out really what, what they are and, and you'll be fine. Some people would call it sacrifices. Some people would call it passion and getting to do what you want. You know, so it kind of depends on how you see the problem. If you take a startup job, you have to be prepared not to have a job in two years. All of a sudden, not to have a job. You have to have uh, the, uh, you know, the, the ability to withstand that. So on the other hand, every per like I, just one of the companies I started just fired five people. They all got a job within a week. So. Um, you have to be prepared to change companies and do different things. Um, if you're a large company, you have the security blanket of being in a large company. They can fail, or they can, or you can get fired. Uh, when I when I was young, you, you go to a company, you work your whole career in a company. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, so you have to have a little bit more willingness to to uh, take a big risk, uh, but it's not that big. A tolerance for uncertainty is good when you're working for a startup and the ability to take those risks. You know, if, if you're young, if you don't have a family, especially, if nothing really matters, um, great opportunities to start with startups. And you guys are smart. You come from MIT, right? A company goes under, you will find a job, like David said. You know, it's just a matter of being able to, uh, to weather that change well and think about it positively. You know, some of the, the best entrepreneurs I, I am friends with have said that their best experiences are from their failures, right? That's when you learn the most. So if you go to a startup and it fails, that's great. That's, you know, a tick on your, your entrepreneur belt. You got one of those failures underneath you. But it presents you with some challenges. As long as you're prepared for them, it's great. Um, but, you know, I have this discussion with students all the time, big companies, small companies. And the one offers more stability, one offers more risk, one offers more excitement, one offers more... Um, certainty. But it's interesting because different students perceive those as good or bad. Some students think stability is good, some think stability is bad. Some actually think big companies are great because they offer lots of opportunities, right? Because they do a whole bunch of stuff, whereas a small startup, you're doing one thing and you're doing it really well. So it really just depends on, on what you're looking for in your experience. Which one would suit you better? Try both. Yeah, that's honestly the only way you're going to know is to work in those environments and see what you like. So it's that in theory versus in practice, right? So you can think about what you like in theory, but until you get there and you sit there in the organization, you don't know if it's really for you or not. And talking about uncertainty, I remember times 
where I wasn't sure I would have a job six months later when I worked in a huge company. So there's uncertainties everywhere. So there is maybe one more question all the way in the back row, and then. What part of an academic job interests you specifically? Go to a teaching school. There are so many schools that would like to find good chemistry teachers that will not require you to find grants and do a lot of research. Those are exactly the kind of schools that you should be targeting. They are out there. They are not the MITs of the world like we were mentioning earlier, but they're out there and they're wonderful institutions with really great students. But you know, if you, if you don't like writing grants and you don't like doing research, you probably don't belong at a research university. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> well, but doing it, you know, it's just funny because doing it and managing it are two totally different things. And I don't think a lot of PhD students realize that. They figure they enjoy their PhD, so then they must want to be a professor. But once you get to be a professor, you realize that you are not actually doing the research quite so much as you're managing it, funding it, sustaining it, and, and strategically thinking about it. So they're very different kinds of jobs. Any more questions? Well, we're approaching the end of our panel anyway, so thank you very much for coming, and I hope to see you in one of our two other events. And thank you to our panelists.